Let's move on here on the program. Uh, the entire national capital, in fact, the entire country was shocked in utter disbelief when the Shraddha Walkar murder case came to light a few weeks ago. Now, there is another such case. This time, it is young Nikki Yadav, who was murdered brutally at the hands of her boyfriend, Sahil. Her body was stored inside a freezer, and the same day, Sahil went on to marry another girl. Now, the question that needs to be asked, whether it was in the Aftab case or now in the Sahil case, is what is this depraved mentality? What kind of depraved man can end up doing something like this? What is this mindset? Is it faulty upbringing? Is it the fact that uh, none of the people around them, their friends or family, are able to detect this kind of psychotic behavior? Or is it simply the absolute lack of fear of law? Sahil strangled uh, Nikki Yadav to death uh, with a phone charger that was present in his in his vehicle itself. And after that, from Kashmiri Gate, he comes down to this place at which I am standing right now. I am standing at Mithron Village at the very dhaba in which it has been alleged uh, the, the body of uh, Nikki Yadav was found out here. This no February ki unki mangni thi, 10 February ko shadi honi thi. No tarikh ko unki mahila mitra Nikki Yadav ko pata chala. तो उन्होंने कन्फ्रंट करने के लिए उनको बुलाया था उसमें गुस्से में आकर साहिल ने अपने महिला मित्र का अपने मोबाइल फोन के केबल से गला घोट कर उनका मर्डर कर दिया पांच दिन की रिमांड ले लिए यही सारी चीजें करने के लिए सीक्वेंस को एस्टेब्लिश करने के लिए साक्षियों को और मजबूत करने के लिए So here's the sequence of events. Sahil and Nikki, they met and started dating back in 2018. Soon after, they started living together. This was in a rented accommodation in Greater Noida in the outskirts of the national capital. During the 2020 lockdown, they both returned to their respective homes. And once the lockdown was lifted, they started living together again. This time in a rented house in the western part of the national capital in a place called Dwarka. Sahil did not inform his family that he was in a relationship while they were urging him to get married all this while. So in December of last year, his wedding was fixed with another woman. The wedding date was the 10th of February. All this while, Nikki was clueless. She was completely in the dark about Sahil's wedding plans. And then on the 9th of February, after Sahil got engaged to this other woman, Nikki got wind of Sahil's quote-unquote double life. So the couple set out in Sahil's cousin's car. This was around 11 p.m. on the night between 9th and 10th of February. They drove to Kashmiri Gate, which is in the central part of uh, Delhi. It's a very busy metro uh, station as well. Nikki there confronted Sahil about his wedding plans with this other woman. The couple then had a heated argument, and all of this is happening inside Sahil's cousin's car. Sahil then, in a fit of rage, ended up allegedly strangling Nikki with the data cable of his phone, which was lying around in his car. After killing Nikki, Sahil then panicked. He drove around with Nikki's dead body, still strapped in with a seatbelt. He drove around with that dead body in his cousin's car for 40 kilometers. Basically, from the central part of Delhi, he drove all the way crossing states into Haryana. At about 4 in the morning, he went to a dhaba in Najafgarh, which is right on the outskirts between Delhi and Haryana. Uh, apparently, this is a dhaba that's owned by his family. The dhaba was closed on account of his impending wedding. Sahil then stuffed Nikki's body inside a freezer in the dhaba, and then he left. And here's the, the more macabre part. After leaving that, after, after having committed this heinous crime, after storing his girlfriend's body in a freezer, he goes home, gets ready, and gets married a few hours later. Now, before she was strangled by her boyfriend with a charging cable and stuffed inside a fridge, Nikki was last seen alive on the 9th of February. Now, this is CCTV footage that's been acquired from the building where she lived. It was taken just hours before her murder. Nikki is seen entering that building and climbing the steps to her apartment. Now, it's important. It's important to note 
that she was alone at this time. Sahil was not seen anywhere uh, in the CCTV footage. You can see her entering the building and then walking up the stairs into her apartment. Nikki's family was not aware of her living relationship with Sahil and they got to know about her murder when the Delhi police actually contacted them. Now, this is the vehicle in which Nikki was killed. Police have seized the car. It was supposed to be Sahil's cousin's car. He strangled her with a data cable. He kept driving the car. Like I said, he drove for another 40 kilometers. Right next to him was this dead body, seatbelt intact. After driving for, for around 40 kilometers and ending up uh, in another place, almost at the border with another state, Sahil ended up at this dhaba that was owned by his family. After reaching this dhaba in Najafgarh, Sahil then unloaded Nikki's body and kept it inside the refrigerator. He then drove to his house, which is again 40 kilometers back uh, towards Delhi, and then within the next few hours got married to another woman almost as if nothing ever happened. The police finally tracked him down. Sahil told them that the dhaba was shut because of his wedding and that the fridge was not working. He then led the police to the body. CNN News 18 has also accessed the very first pictures of Sahil getting married just hours after murdering his girlfriend, who he was in a relationship with for five years. For five years, he was seeing this girl, living in with her, wanted to break up, that's fine, that's natural. Couples break up all the time. But it is absolutely befuddling that no one in his family or their friends or in Nikki's family for that matter suspected anything. Now, this new bride we're given to understand and, you know, our heart goes out to her because she has to live through this nightmare. She's now gone back to her family home. Shocking details coming out from the Delhi Police Sources at this point in time. So, yes, this incident happened on the intervening night of 9th and uh, 10th February. On, remember, on the 9th of February was the engagement of Sahil Ghalot and on the 10th of February was the uh, marriage of uh, Sah uh, Sahil Ghalot. So, yes, uh, on the 9th of February, he... He, uh, on the intervening 9th of 9th and 10th February, he strangles his live-in girlfriend who, who, who they were living in for almost 4 to 5 years. Now they initially met in the year 2018 and since then they have been living, li living together. So this incident happened on the intervening night of uh, 9th and 10th February at Kashmiri Gate where the, the Sahil strangled uh, Nikki Yadav to death. Uh, with a phone charger that was present in his in his vehicle itself, and after that, from Kashmiri Gate, he comes down to this place at which I am standing right now. I am standing at Mithron Village, at the very dhaba in which it has been alleged uh, the, the body of uh, Nikki Yadav was found out here. So yes, Sahil drove all the way from Kashmiri Gate to uh, to this dhaba out here in Mithro Village in in Nazafgarh. That is approximately a distance of 40 kilometers. And in the meanwhile, he kept the he kept the body of Nikki Yadav in the front seat itself. And he went around driving fearlessly and in that duration of 40 kilometers, no one actually raised any suspicion that a dead body was lying in the front seat of that vehicle. And once reaching out here in his dhaba, he went, went ahead and kept that body, in fact concealed that body in a, in a fridge at his dhaba. And while Nikki Yadav's last rites took place in Jhajjar in Haryana this evening, she had visited home around a month ago. She had kept in touch with her parents and siblings and reportedly called them every single day. Therefore, when she did not call for a couple of days, first on Saturday and then the following day, the family kind of got worried. Nikki's father got in touch with one of her friends who then informed him that she was not at this rented flat and that she was last seen with Sahil. Nikki's father then got in touch with Sahil but was reportedly misled every single time he confronted Sahil about where his daughter was. In the interrogation that has happened, uh, what are the details that he has revealed uh, till now and whatever he, he has said, are those details being corroborated with evidences and is, is his statement uh, coming out to be true? We have taken five days to verify his uh, statement. We have sent multiple teams to check CCTV footage of the route. We have been collecting all kinds of evidence, technical evidence biological DNA evidence and physical evidence. Most of it has been corroborated. So far in the investigation, I can say that the girl was upset with the information that he is getting married the next day. They had a heated argument in the car and he strangulated her with the 
the data cable of his mobile phone. This has come on record so far. These are the facts as of now. Meanwhile, CNN News 18's Anshul Singh also confronted Sahil as he was being sent to police remand for five days. Accused Sahil has just reached the crime branch office. If you see Sahil, who is the main culprit in this entire case, and he is accused of, of in the manner in which he went ahead and and went ahead and killed Nikhil. Just try and get in a word. Sahil, 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 you are scared. You are scared. You are scared. And of course, this is not the first time that such depravity has come to light. Just earlier this month, there was another case. This was a 27-year-old man who killed his live-in partner and stuffed her body into a mattress. In October of last year, there was a woman who was raped, killed, and her body was stuffed inside a suitcase, again in the national capital region, this time in Gurgaon. In December of last year, a man from Jharkhand killed his wife, chopped her body into 18 pieces, and then threw the body parts uh, into different uh, locations in and around where they used to live. And of course, the most blood-curdling of them all was the Aftab Shraddha case. Aftab Punawala strangling his living partner Shraddha Walkar, chopping her body into 35 pieces and then scattering them in a forest not very far from where they used to live. So what exactly is going on here? What explains this kind of depravity? Joining me now is uh, someone who has seen policing in the national capital from very close quarters, former Delhi Police Commissioner, IPS officer and former Lieutenant Governor of uh, Puducherry, Dr. Kiran Bedi is now joining me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bedi, for speaking with us. Uh, we've had these two extreme cases of depravity, almost animal-like behavior. Uh, it was Aftab a few weeks ago, and today it is Sahil. What is going on here? Help us understand. I mean, what, what causes this kind of absolutely debased behavior? Is it lack of fear of law, or is it that some people just happen to have a very devious mind? I think it's exceedingly um, irresponsible, unconscientious parenting. The way we are producing our children, the way we are grooming our boys and girls both, the way we are educating them, we are more degree-oriented rather than value-based. So the values are minus in our education. There's no humanity. There's no human being. It's only learning a skill, not living a life. So I think that's where we're going wrong. It's the home. I would uh, put the blame first on the homes, the parents, and then both education as well. How do we groom our children in the classrooms, boys and girls both? And girls emotionally uh, very, very, um, very fragile, emotionally very fragile. And the boys, uh, 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 no, res no respect for law. So I think we are going wrong in very heavily parenting. And parenting is not becoming an issue at all in our society. Parenting is all by accident. It's not by care, but accident. I also want to talk a little bit about, you know, the extreme nature of these uh, cases. It, it does raise questions. I mean, here is a, a young man, Sahil, in his 20s. Uh, he is in a relationship with this girl for five years. For whatever reason, I mean, couples always break up and that's, that's, that's okay. But he murders her. He gets rid of her body, hides it in a freezer. And I'm amazed. I mean, he's driving around 40 kilometers from central Delhi all the way to the border with Haryana. And nobody in the area, none of the neighbors, passers-by, and, and forget about them, even his friends or family seem to have a damn clue. I mean, what does that say about us, about society, about people around this, this young man? Everybody's now in a rat race. We are all short of time. We are all very occupied and preoccupied with our own goings on. I don't think. So we got to investigation will show whether it came to the notice of anybody or not. And did they ignore it? But I don't think if anybody had seen it and would ignore it. But I think it's more on impersonal lives now. So, so tell me, I mean, this is clearly psychotic behavior, whether it was Sahil or Aftab before him. Uh, and these days, you know, People, young people are living in, um, they're going on dating apps, uh, they're going on blind dates. You can't stop that. And I, I don't think stopping that would be either practical or, or logical. But is there something that young people uh, can, can look for in terms of telltale signs? If a person is behaving in a certain fashion, then your antennas need to go up. Something's wrong with him. 
uh, are there signs that can be picked up for this kind of psychotic behavior before it gets to uh, such extreme cases where you know people are killed and bodies are cut up i think defiant ch childhood children defying parents now is the norm almost becoming the norm having good uh, children who are listening to their parents loving respecting caring and bonding i think is one one group the other is um, no relationship um, it's a user relationship you give me this and i do this Correct. parents almost are afraid of adult children girls and boys who threaten to leave homes if parents don't go, uh, go by them so i think parents are afraid and parents then finally give up and they distance themselves because they see what can they they feel helpless i think a stage is coming where parents are becoming helpless of many of their teenaging children boys so, and girls both so so the fact that such violent crimes are happening against women it's happening in the national capital and it's happening repeatedly i mean i have just enlisted about three or four cases that have happened in the last one year and this is the stuff that's you know come out into the media god knows how many such cases are there which have not been reported about what does it say according to you dr bedi about the utter lack of fear of the law in the national capital i think society is accepting violence as a part of its life we as, as in the society we ignoring violence we are not talking the language of peace peace is not part of our growth i think that's where we are suffering from violence is becoming the norm being unlawful is almost getting away and you can get away as they see punishment doesn't come too soon punishment is not exemplary punishment okay. is also there's no social taboo to these things the, i think the social norms having changed the the therefore the violence is becoming the norm it's not a taboo being somebody violent will unlawful is not being looked down upon violence is being tolerated in a big way so violence then comes enters the homes as well now right, one final word and and again i know you've talked about this in the past as well that there needs to be exemplary punishment but you know we've said this right from uh, 2012 when nirbhaya happened it's been more than 10 years now uh what do you think needs to be done so that at least this case or the shraddha case or any of the cases that we've seen in the recent past become an example for potential such deviant uh, behavior zaka message now is becoming exemplary punishment within weeks mm -hmm. within yeah. weeks and such punishment should be nothing but death by pen death death penalties or or imprisonment for life no remissions Okay, no yeah. remissions after 14 years unless they she see the threatening life inside a prison and also within 2 months maximum 2 weeks when the memory is fresh i think that's very very important that it the person is hung while the crime memory is yeah, fresh is still alive all right okay we'll leave it at that dr kiran bedi always a pleasure speaking with you thank you very much for joining us uh, we'll keep a close tab on how this case progresses and the delhi police's investigation into it meanwhile Let's shift focus from the north to the south, where in Tamil Nadu, a 28-year-old army jawan was allegedly beaten to death in the Krishnagiri district. The deceased is Prabhu. He served uh, in Jammu and Kashmir. He got into a verbal spat with a group of people, one of whom happened to be a DMK councillor, Chinna Swami. This was over washing clothes at a public tank. Later, that argument escalated into a full-blown attack, with more and more jo men joining this DMK councillor in thrashing Prabhu. A murder case has been registered against nine men, including this DMK councillor who is currently absconding. Six out of these nine people have been arrested so far, but the councillor, the man who started this entire fight, he is still at large. So this entire incident happened on the eighth of February. Uh, here's a breakdown of what exactly happened. This ward councillor, his name is Chinnasamy. He got into a fight with Prabhu's brother Prabhakaran, who also happens to be serving in the Indian Army. When Prabhu tried to break both of them up, that's the councillor and his elder brother, the councillor and his goons started beating Prabhu instead. Prabhu was beaten with iron rods and sticks, after which he was rushed to a private hospital. He succumbed to his injuries five days later, and like I said, six out of these nine accused have been arrested, but the main accused, the DMK councillor Chinnasamy, is still absconding. CNN News 18's Purnima Murli spoke to the deceased army man's sister-in-law, his brother's wife. This is what she had to say. 
என்ன மேடம் நடந்தது இந்த சம்பவம் எப்போ நடந்தது இது எட்டாம் தேதி மேம் ஒண்ணுமே இல்ல ஒரு சின்ன பிரச்சனை மேம் வேணுமே முன்பாக காரணமா ஆளுங்களும் கூட்டு சேர்ந்து அடிச்சு கொண்டுட்டாங்க மேம் யாரு மேடம் எங்க வார்டு கவுன்சிலர் மேம் ஓகே ஆ அது நீ மில்ட்ரிக்கு போய் என்னடா என்ன புடுங்க முடியும் சொல்லி சொல்லி அடிச்சாரு மேம் எப்பறா நீ மில்ட்ரிக்கு போற பார்க்கறேன்னு சொல்லி சொல்லி அடிச்சாரு மேம் அதே மாதிரி மில்ட்ரிக்கு போகாம பண்ணிட்டாங்க மேம் அப்புறம் ஹாஸ்பிடல் கூட்டிங் போகும்போது ரொம்ப சீரியஸா அடிலாம் பட்டு ஆமா மேம் அவருக்கு வெளியே அடி ஒண்ணு கூட இல்ல மேம் ஜஸ்ட் சின்னசா ஒரு பொட்டு சைஸ் தான் மேம் வெளிய அடி ஃபுல்லா உள்ளடி மேம் இங்கேயே மயக்கம் போட்டு உயிரே போயிருச்சுன்னா மேம் நினைச்சோம் அப்படி விழுந்தவனே அவங்க பைய ராஜ பாண்டி கழுத்து மேல எட்டி எட்டி ஒதுக்கிறான் மேம் சாவுட சாவுட சாவுடன்னு அடிக்கிறாங்க மேம் வேணும்னே மேம் முன்பகு ஏதோ காரணம் வச்சு கட்டி லாடு கட்ட அவங்க கைக்கு என்னென்ன கிடைக்குதோ எல்லாத்தையும் வச்சு எல்லாம் சேர்ந்து அடிச்சு கொண்டுட்டாங்க மேம் எங்க ஃபேமிலிக்கெல்லாம் எங்க மச்சினரு எங்க வீட்டுக்காரு எங்க மாமனாரு மூணு பேர் தான் மேம் மூணு பேருமே சீரியஸா கண்டிஷன்ல தான் மேம் ஹாஸ்பிட்டல் அட்மிட் பண்ணோம் இப்ப மிலிட்ரி காரணக்கே இந்த நிலைமைனா மற்றவங்களுக்கு இது இதோட இன்னும் எந்த நிலைமை மேம் வரும் கேட்டா வார்டு கவுன்சிலர் அவன் பையன் போலீஸ்ன்ற தைரியத்துலாம் அடிச்சுட்டான் மேம் உங்களுக்கு கண்டிப்பா இதுக்கு நியாயம் கிடைச்சா மேம் ஒன்னும் ஒரு பாவம் அறியாது விடிஞ்சா மிலிட்ரிக்கு போகணும் மேம் அவன் டூட்டிக்கு All right uh, this is an absolute shocker from Krishnagiri in Tamil Nadu let me go across uh, to Madhuvanthi Arun who's a leader of the Tamil Nadu BJP Suman Sri Raman political analyst also joining us uh, i mean it's utterly shocking uh, i'll start with Madhuvanthi Arun because you know here is a a jawan somebody who's serving the nation who is uh, you know bravely defending our country and he's been beaten black and blue by this DMK councilor and his goons just over some petty argument i mean it was about you know using water from a public tank how does one even begin to explain this and the fact that this man is still not under arrest he's still on the run i mean that that is telling uh good evening and uh, good evening to my fellow panelists also here the point being that this is not about uh, a tiff over a water issue the point here is i don't know if you heard the family members speak right now mm-hmm. she clearly said that this was some preempted episode and this water issue was just something to trigger the whole incident and she clearly stated how he was beaten to death and that it was all internal bleeding and that even after he swooned and fell the son of this counselor was kicking him in the neck saying die you know let me see how you will go to the army let me see what you will pluck literally in tamil that is exactly what she had spoken right now and i want this to be recorded for national television because you really need to understand what has happened here and this is despicable disgraceful to say the least and i do not understand where law and order is headed in tamil nadu because this is not the first episode sometime back we saw somebody being hacked to that outside a court premises in coimbatore yeah nothing and then you we all are aware of the cylinder blast that was spoken about as though it was some woman cooking in her kitchen which then went then we realized that it was a terror attack that was avoided so so many things happening in tamil nadu and i do not see any of the tamil media even taking this up i don't understand what the chief minister of tamil nadu is doing because all this comes under his uh, jurisdiction i must say it's his department so i want to know what is this the dravidian model that we are talking about okay so is let me ask suman si rama uh, you know the, the fact is that this is a, a grave criminal case i mean the fact that it can happen to an army man should be utterly eye opening for all of us and and i'm sure suman you heard what uh, the the kin of the deceased person said yeah. that here was a guy i believe the the son of this dmk counselor is with the police he was beating to kill this army man he was beating so that the army man dies i mean if this isn't utterly shocking and if this doesn't move the needle on the law and order question i don't know what will uh, the bjp is saying suman that this is indicative this is illustrative of a larger breakdown of law and order in the state of tamil nadu uh zaka uh, i think that such incidents are certainly becoming more and more frequent in tamil nadu so that is a matter of grave concern uh look the bigger uh, you know issue for me is that the police still have not secured this man this counselor yeah and uh, that is really a matter of of concern you will recall uh, zaka uh, after the coimbatore blast for days together the state government's uh, version was it was a cylinder blast and by the way 
uh, in the last 3 4 days there have been more than 3 or 4 murders there was a, 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 a person who was uh, uh, beaten to death in chennai uh, today i think that uh, there was a there he was accused of being a thief or something by mistake and he couldn't speak the local language and he was beaten to death so this uh, and of course we know what happened in coimbatore where uh, an und- uh, an under trial who was being brought to court was hacked to death by a rival gang and uh, uh, you know this is not the first time that these kind of incidents are happening in the recent past so i think that serious questions are being asked of the state government there's also the issue of dmk uh, party men sort of uh, you know using high handed methods and this is an extreme high handed method but uh, there are consistent questions which are not being answered and uh, in fact increasingly the question that is being asked in tamil nadu is how much control does mr stalin really have over his party men and uh, you know the general uh, theory now uh, is you know uh, to say sort of uh, you know chief minister is doing his bit but nobody is listening to him so but, but so tell of, me tell yeah. me something i mean uh, whenever the dmk has been in power in the 90s when karnanadi was chief minister yeah. 2006 that term this is always an accusation against the dmk government that law and order goes to the dogs there are these dmk men who run a mock so on and so forth but yeah. that does not necessarily always translate into electoral defeat or electoral costs because law and order may not be the only issue that matters to the people i mean there could be a whole uh, host of issues on which people vote no zaka i i agree with you on that but in this particular case in the last particularly in the last 8 to 10 months Uh, there have been uh, there have been a series of lock up deaths which again do reflect extremely yeah. badly on the state police correct so i think that there are there are serious issues the home department is with the chief minister so technically each of these uh, you know whether it is a lock up death or whether it is these kind of law and order issues they are all squarely at the chief minister's door because he has chosen to keep that department with himself which is the pattern which we have seen in tamil nadu Uh, you know during the time of kalanyar or jailalita and all of them used to keep the home department with mm-hmm. them now the key challenge is how will mr stalin actually face up to these issues okay we have seen in the past high handedness by ruling party men does not have the consequences that it should have this emboldens more party men and no, i so- think that that is where mr stalin seems to be losing the grip So um, so let me ask uh, yeah, Madhuvanti yeah. Arun uh, and I'll give her the final word. I mean the point that Sumanth is making and I think there is some merit there as well. Yes, these are absolutely depraved crimes. Stuff like this should not happen and there should be political accountability for it, and especially all the more so if the chief minister holds the home portfolio. But whether it was in that case that we saw a few weeks ago where uh, there were this DMK men who misbehaved with a woman police constable at a rally or now this story The sad reality Madhuvanti Arun is that you know this will be there in the news cycle for 2 or 3 days maybe a week at best and then the media will move on and the moment the media moves on it seems like the people have also moved on No I But totally agree with you Zaka and that is my problem that is my only problem this is not something that the media should take up and give up after 2 days but then you don't have a choice you have other things to cover but I want to know what the state police is doing I want to know what the chief minister of Tamil Nadu is doing is he in hibernation what is going on like suman sir raman very rightly said the home department comes directly under him he chose to keep it that way so what is he doing regarding this has he taken any action and this is not the first time mm-hmm. it takes forever for the cm to wake up from his sleep and then for everybody to come out and then say what is what or then it takes somebody like our state president mr annamlai to start a protest start an agitation and then things start moving i mean if this is going to be the case then why does mr stalin have to run the state we'd rather just close down have elections and we'll we'll decide who's going to be the chief minister next okay i don't understand what is going on here because nobody not a single dmk person has come out and spoken i don't see any action being taken i don't know what the police is doing and this is not the first time anybody from the dmk beautifully absconds okay so my final word 30 seconds i got to wrap up i got to wrap up on this yeah so there is no pressure on the dmk to speak up simply because in local media this story hardly exists right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so this has not been picked up at all by the local media for very obvious reasons so there is no pressure on the dmk to speak up because the masses in tamil nadu 
are not necessarily watching national news channels. Okay, no, I, 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 I'll tell you this. I mean, sometimes we tend to sort of overinflate the uh, the thing about the national news channels. But a uh, fact is that in this day and age, when there is social media, there is a way that these stories sort of uh, you know really blow yeah. up. And, and in this case too, like in many other cases of stories, it it first appears on social media and then you know the established media pick it up. But be that as it may, as I thank Suman C. Raman as well as uh, uh, Madhuvanti Arun. Uh, let's see if there is you know, a political cost to pay, a political price to pay for this, simply because we know that the E-Road by-election is coming up very soon. Uh, it's not very far away from, from Krishnagiri. It's a, a few hundred kilometers at best. Uh, so if this is such a, a, an important issue, an issue that is touching a raw nerve among a lot of people, then uh, some of it might have a telling effect on the by-election itself. But we'll see how that story plays out. As we wrap up uh, this edition of uh, Brass Tax, the death toll in the quake-hit countries of Turkey and Syria have now crossed 40,000. The World Health Organization has described the earthquake in Turkey as the worst natural disaster in a century. It characterizes this as the Europe region, both Turkey and Syria, uh, southern Turkey. Uh, the United Nations has estimated that up to 5.3 million people in Syria may be rendered homeless after these earthquakes. Lacks of people are in urgent need of food and shelter. Uh, today, the NDRF provided relief material and aid to Aleppo in northern Syria. It included medication and aid received from international communities. And Syria News 18's Siddhant Mishra has travelled to some of the worst hit places in Turkey. Here's his ground report as we close out the show. We are in Nure Dagi, one of the worst affected areas post the earthquake and in fact uh, behind me also uh, there is this stretch which is completely devastated and in fact this morning when I was uh, passing through I could see people pulling out their sofas they could they, they were pulling out their basic amenities from this debris it is a very dangerous structure and in fact uh, uh, the army air here is not allowing people to go inside because it's very dangerous even locals are also not going inside but but all, always efforts are being made to pick whatever little they can pick. What are the, what are the real problems and what, what help you need from country like India and other countries? What help we should send for you people? Firstly, thanks for everything to come here and help yeah. for us. Yeah. And our government mostly help about everything, uh, about accommodation, food and some clothes. Uh, we don't need any food, any clothes, but uh, most of the problem in here, containers and about some uh, home. It will be a very big challenge for us. Don't know. I'm not sure about this. I don't see tomorrow even what will happen. We will pray to God and we will start to... Um, I don't know. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. So uh, this is a situation of almost every house here in Nure Dagi where I'm reporting from. And in fact, uh, look at the devastation around me. I would ask my video journalist to pan and give sense to, uh, to our viewers. Uh, so this is a level of devastation. In fact, now after, after almost a week's time, people are coming back and they are pulling out uh, their stuff, uh, the basic stuff which is lying here. And in fact, they are... Uh, this is the only hope left and they really don't know they don't have any clue what are they going to do how are they going to build uh, the city they say the only hope is god and they don't have any idea whatever government uh, whatever is possible government is doing all they require is toilets heaters and shelter homes containers so that they can protect themselves from cold